all of those we recognize as they can be a part of grief. We can feel depression, we can feel acceptance. What we now know from large studies where we've studied grieving, we're looking at the same person and interviewing them multiple times over weeks or months or, or longer. And so now we're seeing change over time. And so what we know now from research is that there is not a linear set of stages. And so I think there is another link that can be maintained with the person who's died, expressing that love and experiencing love. Even though it's not with that person, the capacity to do that is because they are still in your, in your brain. They're still a part of the way you're in the world. You are in the world differently because of them. I saw a chart on your website that shows, I think it was showing higher morbidity or mortality rates for those who fail to adapt to loss. Can you address that? Or Welcome to the Bounce Podcast. This is Larry Weeks. Today, I'm speaking with Mary Frances O'Connor. Mary Frances is Professor of Clinical Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Arizona. And she is the director of the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress Lab, where she and her colleagues are creating new frameworks for understanding grief and the grieving process. And her book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss, is the topic of this episode. Those of you on my subscriber list know, very recently, I've lost a dear friend from high school, very suddenly. And I was really caught off guard by its impact on me in the sense that I've studied grief. There's been a prior interview with Dr. Lucy Hone here on the podcast, which I want to point you to as well, around grief. And so my handling of, of this grief, it, it was, I don't know, the floor just kind of fell out under me. At first I was numb. And if I'm being honest, I kind of went into a little depressive mood that I'm just now lifting my head out of. And this is all very normal, I'm sure but it made me want to revisit grief and loss and its impact on all of us in the context of physiology and specifically the brain and the downstream effects of, of all that. And so when I came across Mary Frances's book, I, I really wanted to talk to her about it. So hopefully you can benefit from this as well. So on the show, we discuss her work at the Grief and Loss and Social Stress Lab and the specifics on how grief impacts the brain and the body. And we discuss things like complicated grief. We revisit the model of the five stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. We discuss mortality rates for those who fail to adapt to loss. And then we also cover loss in general. So death isn't the only loss type that elicits grief. You can lose your identity, you can lose a job, anything that you're bonded to can evoke grief when that goes away. And we also have a discussion, and I think it's rather beautiful, of how our lost loved ones can really stay with us outside of any kind of mystical experience. And for the brain, our loved one is gone and everlasting at the same time. And look, it really doesn't matter if you're grieving currently or not, I think you'll benefit from this episode as preparation for difficult loss like this and or something that can help you with other people you may know who are grieving. So in that light, without further ado, here's Mary Frances O'Connor. Welcome to the show. It's so good to be here, Larry. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. I see that you have a lab and, and you, you wrote this great book on grieving. Could you tell me and the audience a little bit about what goes on in the lab? And then yeah. I want to jump into our topic, but I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. So I run the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress Lab, which we call the Glass Lab. And it really is an opportunity to use the scientific method to study this thing which feels so ephemeral sometimes of grief and grieving. And we use a whole bunch of different methods. I think one of our best methods is, of course, the clinical interview. We've seen a lot of people who are grieving, so it just doesn't bother us if you cry uncontrollably. We feel compassion for you, but 
you know, it doesn't take us by surprise. And then we use neuroimaging. So that doesn't take place in my actual lab. We have to go to a, an fMRI scanner for that. And then we've used blood draws to look at immune parameters. We use EKGs to look at cardiovascular parameters. Uh, so all sorts of things, really. How did this come about? What was the path from zero to a lab on, <laughs> on grieving and all things loss? Well, I was sitting in my first year clinical grad student, clinical psychologist grad student class, and we read an article that talked about the difference between grief and depression. And I was just hooked. I thought that was fascinating. And particularly, I think because while a lot has been written about how grief feels, I really wanted to understand why and how. Why does it hurt? So, why does it take so long? How does our mind understand it? And that led me to neuroscience to think about the brain. But in reality, I think there's always many motivations. Certainly the reason I think that I feel so comfortable with grief is that my mom was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer when I was 13. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was not supposed to survive the year. And then she went to live another 13 years, which was sort of my reprieve from the universe, wow. I think. Yeah. yeah. But it meant that grief and depression were certainly in my household. And then at 26, you know, I, I lost a parent. And about seven years ago, my dad died. And so I've had some experiences, but not any worse than anyone else. But I think the key for me is knowing that there is so much research. There is so much more known in the scientific community than people realize in the general public. So my motivation for writing the book was to put that in people's hands. And to some degree, what would it look like to lose a parent, to lose someone you love if you knew all this scientific work? So I talk about my personal life as well. Is there a difference between grief and depression? So we have done some pretty elegant studies just in the last 10 years even in psychology. And it is quite clear to us now that grief, even very severe grief, can be different from depression. So that is to say, after the death of a loved one, you might experience depression. And that's particularly true if you've had depression before, for example, you're at higher risk. But that that's different from grief and the way and, and grieving and even prolonged grief disorder. So the way that I think it's easiest to disentangle those is that grieving is really about the person who's died, right? It's I just want my one and only back. I sort of can't go on without this, this person who's integral to my sense of, of myself and my world. Depression, on the other hand, is a much more global phenomenon. So with depression, you are no doubt upset also about the death of a loved one, but you probably also are ruminating about things that are wrong in your marriage and how you're not doing enough to help the environment and you maybe weren't a good enough daughter and you know, <laughs> you're not performing at work. Depression has this global quality where grief is very specific to this person who's died. So what have you learned about why humans grieve? My thinking is, I'm assuming animals grieve generally, or is this a human-specific trait or attribute of our brains? <laughs> Asking if animals grieve, it really depends on which human you're talking to. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> yeah. human beings disagree on this point. Many social mammals do, especially large social mammals who live a long time and have children who are with them for a long time in childhood. So gorillas and whales yeah. and these mammal elephants, these mammals have behaviors that look an awful lot like what we call grief in humans. And it gets to really the point that I was just saying that grief is really what happens when you love someone, when you're bonded with them, and then they die. So that bond is what comes first. And 
in humans that attachment to, like I said, your one and only, right? Whether you fall in love with your spouse or your child or your, you know, that is what sets up the brain to be very distraught when that person is no longer there. And so as we are attached to people in our environment and our loved ones are as important to us as food and water, I mean, it is really critical for human survival that we have these close loved ones. So when they're out of our sight, there's no problem. The brain says, oh, I have a solution for this. If they're not in sight, we just go get them. Or we make enough of a fuss that they'll come and get us. And that's the solution. And it works very, very well for couples, for parent-child, for even for best friends. The trouble is, in the unusual circumstances where a loved one dies, the brain has a solution, but the solution isn't working anymore. And so you get this experience of, you know, you keep picking up your phone to text them because your brain is still expecting them to be there. And it takes a very long time for your brain to update enough to be able to predict their absence more than their presence. You're saying this is a seeking behavior? Exactly. So you lose someone and because of the strength of that attachment, grieving is largely seeking that person who who is gone. And is that what the rumination is about? Or is it a ball of wax, uh, Mary Frances, where that's where the confusion is, that's where the shock and everything else, you, your brain's in this seeking loop and it, it just can't find it? That is a big part of it. Okay. And especially early on, especially in the you know first days, weeks, months, that is exactly the, the issue that's going on. But we know that there's sort of a second issue as well, which is that when we have a relationship with someone, so let's say I describe myself as a daughter. The word daughter, I'm using that to describe me, but actually that describes two people. If mm -hmm. I say daughter, there's definitely another person involved. Right. <laughs> or if I say spouse, there's another person involved. And so when we have a close relationship to someone, we have this overlapping sense of we, right? We moved here. We bought a couch. We do this and that. We're going to retire together or we're going on a trip or we prefer pizza Fridays. And when a loved one dies, your sense of yourself changes as well because that we is a part of you. So people describe, I feel like a piece of me is missing. And I think that's not just metaphorical. I think the brain encodes a we and then can't quite figure out what to do when it doesn't understand. Well, how are we supposed to do retirement then? Or what do we eat on Friday? So trying to also understand who am I in this world where I've walked through this door and how do I be the best daughter I could be if my mom has died, right? So there's also this updating of who you are as well. One of the reasons I sought you out is I've had conversations, Dr. Lucy Hone, some, some years ago on, she wrote a book on resilient grieving. And I recently, my best friend from high school, and he was like a brother to me, we were just together. And then within a day of seeing him, he just dropped dead. Heart attack, you know, just sudden. But I mean, we just texted, you know, that. Yeah. And I learned a lot about grief and I thought, <laughs> thought, yeah. thought I had. In the previous iterations of experiencing death to people close to me. I had a good friend recently as well, but they were cancer or they were sickness, you know, my sure. father. And the grieving started for me with those prolonged or longer death processes as soon as the news, you know, the diagnosis comes, yeah. right? Yeah. Where you're putting the possibility in your brain that, you know, they, they may not make it or yeah. blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're being hopeful, but there's time to accept or process something. Mm -hmm. Boy, when when my friend David passed, just numbness, just shock. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier, just this my brain was just confused, really. Yes. And then that, that process kicks in. But one of the things I thought of, Mary Francis, and I would love 
to get your input on this is I always come to these moments where, where people pass in my life and, and I say to myself again, my life is short. You know, this is, you know, we're, everything's impermanent, but I'm always surprised and caught off guard with death. Is this just our human hardwiring that this life force kind of ignores death? I, I'm phrasing this all wrong, but you would think evolution would put a little, I don't know, something in the brain that go, don't get too attached or don't. And maybe that's it. Maybe the attachment and the propagation as part of this, the survival instinct has to be so strong or we wouldn't do anything. You know, we wouldn't go outside the door. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I think there is a ton of anxiety, death anxiety that comes along with the awareness um, that you and everyone that you love. That makes sense. So you, you it would freeze right? you in place Absolutely. maybe. Okay. Or presumably right. it would. Anyway, okay. I think that's, that is not always people's experience. So many people, when they do experience the death of a loved one, they have that feeling you were having of, wow, life is short and it really clarifies my what I want to do and who I want to spend time with. So there can be something very clarifying about it. But I think there's also a piece of this, which is that in our period of history, in our culture, death very much happens behind closed doors. And so we don't really incorporate that into our day-to-day -day life, partly because we live longer, but also because deaths usually happen in institutions somewhere and then are cared for by professionals. And so I think there was a much stronger sense of death being a part of life uh, in earlier periods of history and sometimes in other cultures. Um, so the U.S. is a very sort of death-denying kind of culture, although I'm seeing that shift, I'll be honest with you. Why do you say it's a death-denying culture? Because it's kind of kept in, in, in the background or behind doors? I think or, it's a combination of that, certainly, that it is, you know, behind, it's, you know, invisible in many ways. Nobody is, you know, I mean, it used to be if your neighbor was really ill, you would have known and you would have been at the bedside uh, and you yeah. would have been sort of in and out, even though, you know, it, it was just known. We're less or, communal. Yeah, we have less exactly. connections. That's here. right. Or, you know, infant mortality used to be extremely high. So, it would be very unlikely that you wouldn't know someone who lost a child, you know, that year. So, oh, that's, that's interesting. Part of it. That's yeah. interesting, Mary Frances, because the healthier we become or the mm -hmm. safer we become, that event is less it's frequent. It's not as common. Yeah. Exactly. So, children don't have their grandparents living with them and dying, you know, during their lifetime when they're at home as kids. So, that's part of it. I think the other part of it is that in U.S. culture, we're very focused on being happy. And so, if there is some other emotion, we really try to sort of ignore that or put that aside or, you know, shop our way out of it or <laughs> try to, you know, and, and so some of it is because death is behind closed doors and some of it is because when there is grief, it is often not acknowledged very consciously or communally. So, give us some highlights of a grieving brain. Are there temporals or areas that are shut down, what would be interesting to know or useful to know about what you're learning about uh, the impact of grief on the brain? I think one of the things I find most interesting is that many of the things we learn about grieving through neuroimaging or grief through neuroimaging is that it kind of reaffirms things that people have been saying. So people describe grief as being very painful. And they say that and it isn't entirely metaphoric. It's not that you can necessarily point to a part of your body, but it feels painful. And what we're seeing in imaging studies is that the salience part, the part of, of even physical pain, which is sort of partly a sensation, but it's partly also this, hey, pay attention to this. You're, you're going to get hurt here, or uh, you need to you know, take care of this. That aspect of pain that emotional aspect of pain is activated in people who are grieving. Sort of an alert. Hey, something's exactly. wrong. Exactly. Okay. Something is wrong and a sort of very visceral sense of something is wrong. And I think, 
as I say, people have been saying that for a long time. To, so to see imaging studies where that those areas that we see also not exactly the same areas, but in the same neighborhood as the areas that are giving us that emotional alarm for physical pain, I think it makes us, you know, a lot more understanding of perhaps why people describe it that way. That's one of the aspects I find fascinating. Does grieving have a benefit? Sounds awful as soon as I ask it, but all things being equal, I, I've read somewhere, Mary Frances, that it allows us to free up energy that is bound to the lost object or the, the lost person so that, you know, we can reinvest that energy elsewhere. Any truth to that? Or? So this is a an older view of grieving actually comes from Freud. And Freud was, of course, working in the steam engine era. And so this idea that we had sort of limited energy, and if we we had to sort of remove it from the deceased person who we had a relationship with in order to have a relationship with our living loved ones. We live in an era of virtual reality and computers, and we sort of have a very different theory at the moment, which is that our internal relationship, our our virtual relationship with that person who's died often continues. Think about, you know, asking them for advice. You're standing in the, you know, this is a silly example, but you're standing in the grocery store. I'm trying to pick a watermelon. And I think, what would mom have said about how to pick a watermelon, you know? (laughs) And so there's a way in which that can still be with us. They can be with us in many ways that it doesn't necessarily require energy that we need to be spending on someone else. So I think the the more modern view is that the importance of that person changes when they're not in our material world. They're not providing us physical care anymore, for example, or we're not providing them physical care. And so there can be some shifting where we are spending more time with our living loved ones and spending our attention on our living loved ones. But it doesn't necessarily mean that our deceased loved ones have gone away, that we don't have, you know, an altar in our house or the graveside that we go visit. And and that can actually enrich our lives when we're reunited with that feeling of clarity. You know, we were just talking about that feeling of sort of carpe diem. And so remembering your loved ones can sort of remind you, oh, gosh, yes, I really need to be paying attention to what's important here. So there, I think there can be lots of benefits from maintaining what we call these continuing bonds. So is it a process that we should or need to go through to handling these type of losses? I think one of the most useful things that I've discovered through doing research is that there's a difference between grief and grieving. So making this distinction helps answer the question. So let me tell you how I think of those as different. Grief, grief is the noun. Grief is that wave that knocks you off your feet. In that moment, you're really aware of how bereft you feel for this person who's gone. Grieving, on the other hand, is the way that grief changes over time, but grief doesn't ever go away, right? Grief is a normal human emotion. So anytime you are aware of the loss of this person who's so important to you, in that moment, you will feel grief. But because of grief changing over time, you will probably have those moments of grief less frequently or less intensely, or they become more familiar. Even even that is a change, right? Where the first hundred times you think, I'm not going to get through this moment. And then the hundred and first time you think, this is terrible, but it's fam- I know what it is. It's familiar. And so if you confuse the two then I think people assume that over a period of grieving, they will never experience grief again. And that is just not true. So my sister is getting married in the fall, for example, which I'm very excited about. But I know that on that day, we will have this wave of grief at some point because my mom would have desperately wanted to be there 
you know? And so in that moment, we'll be very aware of our grief. It doesn't mean there was anything wrong with the grieving process that we've been doing up till then. It it's not like you didn't that, complete it, right? Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Do you ever get over anger? Do you ever get over it's a wave. joy? It's <laughs> right. A, they're waves. Right. Exactly. They're just human emotions. They're natural yeah. responses. Emergent. To what's happening. Yeah, exactly. But with grieving, we usually get a better handle on how we react when we feel grief. And that development over time uh, is what most people experience as sort of reconstructing a meaningful life or sort of building a life now that you understand you're a person who can experience profound grief. One of the things that helped me is, again, I'm, I talked to Lucy Hone and she had mentioned ambush grief, which mm. just for the audience, I, I was in, uh, soon after my mother and sister passed, I was in a store, not thinking about mom and, mom and sis. And all of a sudden I saw something that my mom would want or my sister, I, I, it's been so long, I, I can't remember, but I think it was my mother, something I, and I immediately reached out to buy it for her. And for just a brief moment, for, forgot that she, had, I, yeah. that sounds weird, me saying this, yeah, but it, it's I, totally you true. know, my system just went into automatic and yep. to, to get it. And as soon as I realized I was, it's, I think it's an apt description for ambush, this yeah. grief, I was crying in a store, just like, yeah. like that. But identifying it, it having a name was helpful because yes. I, I didn't feel like there was anything wrong with me or that it was... Yeah you know, universal condition, it, it's going to happen. I just, and, and I'm glad I was aware of it because it, it was so unusual. You know, I was like, I thought I was over it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then I've been in movies where something happens, there's death in the movie or yeah. hell, I'm watching a commercial, right. No. Or, you know, and then I'll just, the a gets. wave is a good, a good description, this yeah. tidal wave of emotion. And I'm, I'm weeping and I'm like apologizing. Hey, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I think that's exactly how it works. So I think that just as you say, it's just this sudden awareness. And that awareness can be created because, you know, our brains are, they're prediction machines, right? The whole point of having the brain is to really just try to predict what might be happening next. And then hopefully we can prepare for it a little bit. And so our brain uses thousands and thousands of days of experience to predict what's going to happen. And that doesn't change instantly when someone dies. So, you know, the classic one that a lot of widows and widowers describe is waking up in the morning and thinking their loved one's going to be next to them in bed, right? Because mm. that has happened over and over and over and over. And it doesn't actually make good sense for your brain to stop predicting that right away. And also the importance of that person. And it, you know, sort of continues to motivate us to have this belief on some level, even while at the same time, a different stream of information in our brain has the memory of them dying or the memory of being at their funeral. And so the strange thing about the brain is it doesn't mind listening to these two conflicting streams of information at the same time, but it's very emotional for us to recognize that I'm, I, you know, I have this belief that they're out there, you know, I'm, I'm having this relationship with them and then also realize that's not reality. So I think that explains some of the intensity of why it's so painful, but also why it takes so long, because your brain doesn't update that prediction. I'm assuming everybody experiences grief, but they just express it differently. That's okay. a great distinction you're making. So there's a big difference between what you experience internally and what you express on the outside so that others might know that you're feeling it. And that's different for a whole bunch of different reasons. We're socialized differently. Our families have different sort of grief rules. Our cultures have different grief rules about expression. So the experience of grief is quite universal. And in your brain scans, there wasn't an anomaly where someone had a very similar loss, but th their brains lit up differently. 
there's a ton of individual variability in the way our brains react to things. But we also didn't have anyone in the studies who were who said that they weren't experiencing grief. And so I, I'm not sure that I would have identified that. I think it actually would be very interesting to look at people who have had the death of a loved one, but don't necessarily express or even say they're experiencing a lot of grief. Yeah. Now that I think about it, the loss of a person, it all depends on that relationship. So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's based on the bond. And think about, oh my gosh, how many different kinds of love you have for all the different people in your life. It makes sense then that the type of grief you're going to have for all those different people will look pretty different as well and feel different as well. And so what we know is when it is a person with whom you have a very close relationship, as in you feel comforted when you're with them, you want to spend time with them, you do spend time with them, you want to seek them out when things are going badly, but you want to seek them out when things are going really well, that kind of attachment relationship does usually create the internal experience of grief. However, there are lots of people who will say to me, I'm not experiencing grief. Am I, am I a monster? Is this, you know, my mom has died. Is this a terrible thing? And I think there are a number of situations that are pretty common, actually. So, for example, if someone has been ill for a very long time and we've been providing care for them, which we were no doubt willing to do and in many cases even quite happy to do to give this to another person, there can still be an enormous sense of relief that this person isn't suffering anymore or that your life is not as stressful as it was. Yeah, yeah. I experienced that with my father because yes. he had a protracted illness and mm -hmm. you know he suffered so much there at the end that there was a sense of relief Absolutely. as soon as the you know the the event con concluded. So I, I I certainly get that. I saw a chart on your website that shows, I think it was showing higher morbidity or mortality rates for those who fail to adapt to loss. Can you address that or, or correct me? And then tell us what is complicated grief. Mm -hmm. The first one first, there is something that we call the broken heart phenomena, sometimes also called the widowhood effect. And it is that we know from very large studies, it's been replicated many times now, that for, say, for example, a man whose wife dies, he is at higher risk for his own mortality in the next six months compared to a man who remains married, who's similar in age and health and so forth. He's actually almost twice as likely to die as his married counterpart. It is the same for women as well, a slightly lower risk. But what this tells us is there's something physiological going on. You can't attribute it to, oh, well, this person was smoking or, you know, they've, they've done all these controls. And so we know that there is an acute physical effect of bereavement. And it shows up in things like Many people have slightly higher blood pressure in the first six months or slightly higher heart rate, higher stress hormones like cortisol, for example, for most people. And so this tends to naturally resolve as the body and the brain and the mind come to understand what has happened. And so those things come back to normal for that person. There are instances, though, where we see longer term effects. And so it can be more than six months, more than a year. And one of the reasons we think this might be happening is grief, the feeling, that wave of grief is physically very stressful for your body. And so to be having that over and over again in the same way that you were having it in the first few months for years, you can see the type of wear and tear that that might take for the body. And so we do see also increased risk of illnesses further out for people who are bereaved, but at much lower rates. So not as common. I think that's what happened to my, my mother when as tragic as losing my sister was, part of the tragedy was the impact of my mom. And then it wasn't too long before she, she passed. Mm 
yeah. she got sick. So I can certainly see that. Are there mitigations since we flagged a risk for those type of losses? Are there ways to mitigate that, like maybe other attachments or family or other friends? It's a great question. I think one of the most sort of obvious, because it is a risk factor. We know it's not a, an enormous risk factor, but it is a risk factor. And so I think one of the most obvious things is remembering this is a time where this person needs not just emotional care, but good physical care as well. And so you know, especially if they've been a caregiver for a long time. But even if they haven't, it is time to go and have your regular annual checkup, right? How long has it been since you had your mammogram? How long has it been since you've been to the dentist? You know, these types of physical care are very important in a person who is in this highly stressful situation. And things like blood pressure, well, they're going to be picked up just in the doctor's office. It doesn't have to be, there's nothing magic about it. And then a doctor can address high blood pressure just as they would in any other patient. So some of it is certainly about intervention, right, of that type, support and intervention of that type. But it is also trying to find ways to have some comfort or even just relaxation. So a graduate student, former graduate student, and I did a study where we looked at what's called progressive muscle relaxation, which is just a sort of structured way that you can spend some time going through the muscles of your body and sort of tightening and then relaxing them and experiencing the feeling of them being relaxed, really getting a sense of what that feels like and spending some time in that relaxed state. Well, this is obviously good for your body during this stressful time, have some periods of relaxation, but it turned out it also actually helped people's mental state as well. It helped things like their grief and their depression symptoms, their feelings of stress as well. And so I think remembering that this is a this is a time when you need to be caring for your body in a lot of different ways is not something we think about, but I believe is very true. Are there any other practices, I don't know if you studied these in your labs, that help with the grieving process or those that are suffering some form of grief? There are some very good psychotherapies now. And I think of psychotherapy particularly when it has been a longer period of time. So there's some specific psychotherapies for what you mentioned earlier of complicated grief. The more modern term now that's sort of been chosen is prolonged grief disorder. And the idea here is just as we were talking before about how for most of us, for the majority of us, we are actually resilient. So it is incredibly painful. Sometimes the most painful thing that has ever happened to you. And at the same time, people are also, you know, they're getting dinner on the table and they're getting out the door, even if their shoes don't always match, you know, they're, they are <laughs> managing to move forward and find ways to seek comfort and find meaning and so forth. There is a group of people, very small group of people, maybe one in 10 bereaved people or less who don't experience a change over time. It's as though something derails this natural process for them of grieving. And so the psychotherapies that have been developed that are very specifically for prolonged grief disorder, with the relationship of a therapist, they help this person to develop new skills, try out new experiments in their life with the you know, courage and support that the therapist brings with in order to get back on that sort of natural healing trajectory. So it's not that these therapies are going to take away someone's grief. We've already said in this podcast, that's not possible. But it does mean that then we start to see change over time so that this person can sort of jump into the puddle of feeling grief and also be able to jump out of it again. And that's the sign of mental health, really. Would you have any recommendations for a funeral best practice? Let me frame this this way. I've experienced quite a few funerals over the, over the last couple of years, but one that I attended, friends and family were, were gathered at a chapel and 
anybody who wanted to could say something about the person. And a few of them were, were funny stories and they were all touching uh, because yeah. people are talking about uh, what this person meant to their lives. Yeah. That was great. So it's hard to say a funeral is great, but you know, it mm. was meaningful. Uh, it, it was, yeah, meaningful. I feel like people processed it, you know, were, were able to process feelings by attending and talking about the person. Those intuitively seem, you know, one seems better than the other, but is there any, any research around this or, or what just personal recommendation? So with a name like Mary Frances O'Connor, it won't surprise you to know I was raised Irish Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. And this for us is a wake, right? Not the actual funeral, but the wake where, and there's, you know, often alcohol involved because of the Irish Catholic part. <laughs> I will say most of all, it's who is the funeral for, and it's for a lot of different people. And for that reason, it may have a lot of different effects. But I will say that for people who are from a, a strong religious background or a strong religious culture, or even just a specific culture, there is a way that doing some of those you know, what seem like boring, dry as dirt, you know, kind of rituals, for some people that connects them to all the people that came before who stood in their shoes in the same moment of just utter grief. And they found ways to move forward. And so it sort of can connect you back to pieces of your history pieces of your ancestors that can make you feel supported and comforted by doing the same things, saying the same words. So I think it it really varies for what people want out of it, but it varies enormously by your culture and your family and your religion and background. I also would find the type that you were talking about very meaningful, but certainly for my father, there was always a Catholic funeral, and it was very important to him to have all of those symbolic experiences. I certainly see and recognize the importance of the, the, the rituals and, and even the comforting words that are right connected to something bigger than ourselves. So grief is not just around death, correct? Mm -hmm. It could be correct. a job loss. It mm -hmm. could be a city you have to leave, uh, uh, right? Yeah. Now, are the experiences just as impactful? So there's two, I think of the, there being sort of two general groupings. On the one hand, there's the disruption of a bond that happens, but not through death. So you think of divorce, you think of the empty nest. A lot of people feel a lot of grief when their kids move away from home. And those, I think, share a lot of characteristics with the death of a loved one. But remember earlier when I was talking about how a death is often also grief over a part of yourself. Well, I think that makes it, you know, I was saying about how do I be a daughter now that I'm, you know, now that my mother has died. Well, I think there's a similar process where you think sort of like, who am I now if I'm not a professor? if I retire? Or who am I now if I have lost my hearing? Who am I if I've moved? You know, I'm a Montanan. How can I be a Montanan if I'm not in Montana, right? And so I think these other forms of grief feel very similar to us because they are also this loss of a part of our ourselves, of how we know how to function in the world. And so I think in that sense, there is that similarity. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief model, is that still believed or is it still common out there? So she published on Death and Dying, where she talked about those in 1969. And so you think about how far science has come since 1969. Yeah. And this <laughs> is a, just for the audience, the five stages of grief that I think most people have heard about. Denial, anger, bargaining, Depression a couple of others. Depression and acceptance. Yeah. Okay. And what's so interesting is, I think, and she was just a remarkable woman who had the courage to say, no, no, we could actually talk to people 
who are terminally ill, who are grieving, who we could actually ask them what their experience is like, which was completely revolutionary at the time. And she did what all good scientists do at first. She described she described what people were expressing as their experience of grief. And so all of those are true, right? All of those we recognize as they can be a part of grief. We can feel depression. We can feel acceptance. What we now know from large studies where we've studied grieving, and what I mean by that is we're looking at the same person and interviewing them multiple times over weeks or months or or longer. And so now we're seeing change over time. And so what we know now from research is that there is not a linear set of stages. So you don't do all of bargaining and then you're you done with that and you're because moved that, on to, to me, that's the problem, right? To me, that's yeah. the problem. People think I haven't gone through this stage. It's not. That's it, right. They're not. No, some people don't to... ever experience. Exactly. Yes. Some people right. don't experience anger. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your grieving. It's just that hasn't been a part of your grief experience, right? That isn't a part of it for you. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. And also people can you know, experience anger, and then they can experience acceptance, and then they can experience anger again. And again, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It's sort of the moment to moment. So what we think of now is we see that over time in general, the feeling of yearning declines across time. And I mean a long time, weeks, months, years. And the feeling of acceptance tends to increase again, weeks, months, years. So those two things are sort of what we, what we see as typical across grieving. So no, the five stages of grief are not something that we use now. Put People aside. use that as a, sometimes as a hammer on over somebody's mm-hmm. head. You know, it, yeah. I, I've seen it used that way where right. you're in it denial. Right, it was a description. You're, right, yeah. it's not you a are, prescription. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you didn't go, I didn't see you go through this stage. But yeah. I'm exaggerating, but to some no, degree. No, but it's true. Yeah. And it can be very damaging. Yeah. Because people think there's something wrong. Exactly. When it, there's nothing wrong. Like I didn't, you know, my stages were confusion, shock, yes. you know, it was just totally, you know, but it seems acceptance is, is the key for really dealing with grief. You know, when I think about my experience and you mentioned that the brain starts, see, it's a seeking kind of processing that where's this person, where's this person, where's this person? If you can get to acceptance in, in realizing this, the reality is they're gone and, and not coming back, that there's some closure process in that. I think a lot of people experience closure and a lot of people don't. So I sometimes call it accepting instead of yes, I <laughs> right like closure is not the word. Yeah, I, yeah, I, like in the moment you've managed to find accepting, and but I also like to make a distinction and accepting when it comes can bring a lot of peace with it. But I would also make a distinction between accepting and resignation. So some people assume that accepting is going to feel like... Or approving. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. It's not okay with you that this happened just because you're accepting it. Right. I'm I'm using it as as its opposite to resisting, uh, uh, fighting reality. Protesting. It didn't happen. Didn't happen. You know, no, no, no. You know, that... It can't be true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And sometimes even I can't go on or I can't live a good life because this has happened. And accepting, I think, feels a little bit more like you just sort of put something down, right? So the sense of like, it's not that you're never going to feel grief again, but in this moment, you're able to sort of put it down and not be reacting to the fact that this person is gone. Yeah, I, I think it seems to me that people would, and, and I would make it harder for myself even. I mean, it's, all, it's already hard, yeah. but now I'm going to fight this fact that seems to me as an invitation to prolong it. I don't know. Um, A lot of people feel that, that that pain that they're feeling is their last link to the hmm. person. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I think that is often why there is that desire. Everyone is going to experience grief differently. I may be an an expert on grief, but you're an expert on you. You know, you're an expert on your grief. The thing about maintaining that pain as a way to have a link 
it sort of disregards all of the love that you experienced. I mean, the thing that I find amazing about the brain is that it's because this person existed, this very specific person and you had a relationship that changed your brain, physically changed the way the proteins are organized in your brain. And you learned how to love and be loved. And so I think there is another link that can be maintained with the person who's died, expressing that love and experiencing love. Even though it's not with that person, the capacity to do that is because they are still in your in your brain. They're still a part of the way you're in the world. You are in the world differently because of them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Our brains are forever physically shaped by that person that we lost. Yeah. So they're still with us. Yes. Not in some ephemeral, not in some... Nope. A spooky in a way, biological, but, mechanical kind of way. <laughs> but the bond is encoded, right? Yes. And we have some new connections in our brain because of that person, and that is still with you and will always be with you. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> which is a very comforting one, Mary Frances, is there anything else that we should mention that would be key here, or? You know, the only thing that comes to mind is grief can feel very isolating. It can be very hard to express to people how you're feeling and and if you can find someone who can understand who can give you the space and time to and attention to let you describe what your experience is like it is so important to reach out because that really changes it from just my grief to there is grief that is part of being human and that in and of itself can be a connection with other people we mentioned this earlier, but when it comes to grieving and, and grief and dealing with grief is you did mention talk therapy, right? Or psychotherapy, mm -hmm. which is a form of talk therapy that you, you mentioned is, is helpful. I'm assuming then there are support groups for mm -hmm. widows and widowers and, and what have you, or parents who've lost children. I'm assuming you'd certainly recommend those and things that would help you engage with others about the grief, talking, for example? I think it. each person kind of does it differently. And okay. many people want to process it on their own. And then other people need to know if what they're feeling is normal. And a support group can be a great place to find out that other people feel the way you do um, in a place that's designed for people to share. So maybe it's an organic process. And you just ask mm -hmm. yourself, what do I need? And when exactly. do I need it? And then whatever comes up, please, yeah. you know, go there, try yes. that. Yeah. yeah. Were you writing the book through the pandemic or? No, I had written the book before the pandemic happened. There's one tiny little sentence in the book about it that went in with the last edits. So I'm doing research now on pandemic grief. I was about to say, it's a blessing for, I mean, over the last couple of years, huh? you know, I, I can't imagine the, yeah. uh, the, the level of grief and recently just the collective grief we're having, right? Because you mentioned in your book, oh, that's one of the things I wanted to say is that people can feel real grief for people they don't even know or don't know personally. Let's say a movie star or actor or what have you. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. When it's a person, often a singer or someone who expressed the way you feel about the world. So someone who put into words how you feel and think, those people, in a sense, that is a kind of a bond. And so the death of that person can really trigger a sense of real grief, even though you didn't know them in person because of that bond that you had. Yeah, it's all about attachment. And I, I, I used to didn't, didn't really understand that, you know, somebody distant Hollywood actor, but I think I get that now. Mary Frances, thank you so much for coming on. Now, people can find you on your website or would you point them elsewhere? Yes. So maryfrancisoconnor.org and The Grieving Brain, you can buy it anywhere books are sold. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I really appreciate it. It's very helpful. I'm so grateful that you're bringing this conversation to people, Larry. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. 
For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. 